The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up. We heard the girls scream outside. A toddler slips out of her life jacket. The scream that a parent ever wants to hear. And falls right into a pool. It was just like everything froze. Watch as this girl goes through the five stages of drowning. I was doing CPR for over nine minutes. And is brought back from the dead. So all of a sudden she goes, cheese. On today's 700 Club. Welcome to the 700 Club. Dodged questions, that was the hallmark of last night's debate between Vice President Pence and Democratic candidate Kamala Harris. And in a mostly civil debate, a fly, a fly stole the show at one point. The question remains, will their exchange move the needle at all in the upcoming election? Eric Phillips has this report. The American people have witnessed what is the greatest failure of any presidential administration in the history of our country. They still don't have a plan. The debate began with the coronavirus and what the Trump White House did to navigate the pandemic, which has claimed more than 200,000 American lives. President Donald Trump did what no other American president had ever done. And that was he suspended all travel from China, the second largest economy in the world. It's not a day gone by that I haven't thought of every American family that's lost a loved one. Harris insisted the president was not honest with the American people from the outset about the deadly potential of the virus. And when asked if she herself would take an approved vaccine. If Dr. Fauci, if the doctors tell us that we should take it, I'll be the first in line to take it. Absolutely. But if Donald Trump tells us I should that we should take it, I'm not taking it. The dodging began when neither answered whether internal discussions had taken place on a plan in case of disability, given the ages of those at the top of both tickets. Hence, refused to say how a Trump health plan would help those with pre-existing conditions, nor if there would be a peaceful exchange of power if Trump loses. Harris would not speak directly to the Biden team's support of the left-leaning Green New Deal and would not say if a Biden administration would seek to pack the Supreme Court by adding another justice if Judge Amy Coney Barrett is confirmed. I just want the record to reflect she never answered the question. The two did spar over the conservative Barrett nomination, which hangs in the balance less than a month away from Election Day. We particularly hope that we don't see the kind of attacks on her Christian faith that we saw before. Harris said she found that insinuation insulting and pivoted to what she called the real issue. Joe has been very clear, as the American people are, let the American people fill that seat in the White House, and then we'll fill that seat on the United States Supreme Court. Taxes were another battleground. Joe Biden said twice in the debate last week that he's going to repeal the Trump tax cuts. Joe Biden will not raise taxes on anyone who makes less than $400,000 a year. He has been very clear about that. The night did not end without a full discourse on the state of race relations, specifically the deaths of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. Harris quoting what Trump said during last week's debate. The president of the United States took a debate stage in front of 70 million Americans and refused to condemn white supremacists. Not true. And Not true. it wasn't like he didn't have a chance. He didn't do it, and then he doubled down. And then he said, when pressed, stand back, stand by. There's no excuse for what happened to George Floyd. And justice will be served. But there's also no excuse for the rioting and looting that followed. Though it was mostly civil, there well, are a few right signature right. lines from the night. Mr. Vice President, I'm speaking. I have to I'm weigh speaking. In. Senator Harris, you're entitled to your opinion. You're not entitled to your own facts. And at one point during the debate, a fly that landed on Pence's head stole the show. On international relations, Harris slammed Trump for trusting Russian President Vladimir Putin over his own intelligence community. And she called the U.S. trade war with China a big loss. Pence countered by saying that Trump is not afraid to take a tough stand, such as the killing of Iranian General Soleimani. And he reminded viewers that Trump kept his word by recognizing Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and moving the U.S. embassy there, something Biden failed to do during his time in the White House as VP. Eric Phillips, 
CBN News. Thanks. You know, ladies and gentlemen, I'm saying over and over and over again what the Democrats did in the last election. They said these people will not uh, pay for pre-existing conditions. So if you have pre-existing conditions, you lose your insurance. Pre-existing conditions, you lose over and over again. It was said last night. The problem was the vice president was asked that question and he didn't answer it. Now, this is the thing that should be answered. Now, if you go back a little bit in, in history, you don't have to go very far. What was called Obamacare, they can now call it the Affordable Care Act. There was a man named Jonathan Gruber, and he was the advisor to Obama as to how to do it. And he basically said, what you want to do is set up a program that is insured to fail. And when it fails, when it fails, then the private insurers won't be able to handle all the business. And we will begin to move toward a single payer uh, program where the government takes over health care, which is about, what is it, 17, 18 percent of the total economy. And, you know, everybody was opposed to it. I mean, people were screaming, you know, to, to you know, do away with Obamacare. Now it's going to the Supreme Court of all places. It should have been voted down a long time ago. But what was the deal with, with pre-existing conditions and all the rest of it? Uh, the, the House had a plan. The Republicans had a plan. There's no question about it. If, if what is called Obamacare is taken down, then the private insurance will take over and the, the government is absolutely prepared. They're not going to let people with pre-existing conditions go uh, uh, uninsured. That is uh, absurd. But that, that whole thing, you remember Obama went out and he said, if you like your plan, you can keep it. If you like your doctor, you can keep it. He lied blatantly to the American people. If you like your plan, you can keep it. You, you, he was so, so clear. And he lied about all of it. And Gruber had told him, okay, you're supposed to lie. And this was nothing but a tissue of lies. People hated it. But the idea was, very simply, we're going to essentially drive everybody to private plans. And then the, the, the private plans won't be able to accommodate all the need. And then you'll have these exchanges. We had all those health exchanges and all that stuff that, that weren't working. And it was deliberately set up to fail so that we would go to a single payer where the government would take over. And everything that the Democrats have talked about along the way about climate change and these other things is a massive government takeover. I mean, it, 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 it's the heart of all this, whether it's the Paris Accords or something else, it always comes back to the fact we're going to create a crisis and we're going to solve it. And the way to do it is by more government interference. And... I hope people won't understand, will misunderstand all that, but uh, I'm sorry the vice president, he was asked that question about pre-existing conditions and he, he didn't answer it. He didn't say one word. And he should have because the Democrats are going to be beating the Republicans over the head with it for the next few months. Well, in other news, the Presidential Debate Commission says the next debate will be virtual. Not so fast, says President Trump. John Jessup has more. That is right, Pat. The president says he will not take part in a virtual debate, telling Fox News' Maria Bartiroma that it would be a waste of his time. You saying you're not going to participate? No, I'm not going to waste my time on a virtual debate. That's not what debating is all about. You sit behind a computer and do a debate. It's ridiculous. The debate commission announced the virtual format this morning out of concern for the president's COVID-19 diagnosis. The plan was for next Thursday's event to be a town hall format with the candidates in separate locations and the moderator and participants in Miami. While the president has gone at least 24 hours without coronavirus symptoms, that update from his physician, Dr. Sean Conley. In a memo released by the White House, Conley states the president has not had a fever in four days and his oxygen and respiratory rate are normal. He also reported the president is showing detectable levels of COVID-19 antibodies. In a video, the president credited an experimental drug for his turnaround. I walked in, I didn't feel good. A short 24 hours later, I was feeling great. I went to get out of the hospital. And that's what I want for everybody. I want everybody to be given the same treatment as your president, because I feel great. I feel like perfect. So. 
I think this was a blessing from God that I caught it. This was a blessing in disguise. Now, that drug is still awaiting approval. The company Regeneron has applied to the FDA for emergency use authorization. Well, Russia collusion in Donald Trump's 2016 campaign, the topic consumed the Trump administration since day one. Now, declassified material is shedding new light on President Obama's knowledge of an alleged plan by Hillary Clinton's campaign designed to distract the public. CBN's Jenna Browder has the story. John Ratcliffe, the director of national intelligence, has approved the release of nearly 1,000 documents to the Department of Justice. Under scrutiny is the Obama administration's oversight of the Trump-Russia investigation. This at the direction of President Trump after a bombshell you, revelation yes, that then-CIA director John Brennan briefed President Obama in 2016 on a reported plan by the Clinton campaign to link Russian interference with the Trump campaign. Notes from a 2016 White House briefing by Brennan state that Clinton allegedly approved, quote, a proposal from one of her foreign policy advisors to vilify Donald Trump by stirring up scandal, claiming interference by the Russian Security Service. Handwritten notes list POTUS among those at the meeting. Brennan is accusing Ratcliffe of selectively releasing documents. Quote, John Ratcliffe is anything but an intelligence professional. It is appalling his selective declassification of information. It is designed to advance the political interests of Donald Trump and Republicans who are aligned with him. I think Ratcliffe uh, declassified the big one with uh Brennan because it deserves its own storyline. Former federal prosecutor John O'Connor told CBN News' Global Lane program it proves it was the Clinton campaign, not the Trump team, that worked with Russia to influence the election. And that's the irony of it, that we've spent three or four years talking about how Trump supposedly colluded with Russia, where it was all a complete hoax. It's exactly the opposite is true, and it's very profound. Critics of the Mueller investigation are pouncing on the revelations as evidence that it all amounts to massive abuse of power and potential criminal activity by the nation's intelligence and law enforcement agencies. And as we near the 2020 election, many are asking what then-Vice President Joe Biden knew. The person in the campaign responsible for that is Hillary Clinton and the Democrats. Barack Obama, Obama knew about it as early as the summer of 2016. I think it's safe to say that Joe Biden knew about it as well. DNI Ratcliffe has also declassified a CIA memo that notes the Russians believe Hillary Clinton tried to stir up the scandal to distract the public from her use of a public email server. In Washington, Jenna Browder, CBN News. Thank you, Jenna. Pat, back to you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think it's time that they bring prosecution against these people. Uh, they've misused the CIA, misused the FBI, uh, tried to hide documents. Uh, changed uh, stories. I mean, it's been an abomination. And uh, those people should be brought to justice. They, 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 uh, how can you trust the government when they do this kind of thing? And they're, they're charging Trump with that. I mean, he's had nothing but uh, uh, merciless attacks year after year. This whole thing about FISA warrants, the whole thing about Russia collusion, the whole thing about uh, attacks and the Mueller report and the impeachment, the whole thing uh, was, was set up uh, by uh, Hillary Clinton in an attempt to discredit him and to keep him from being elected. You, you've got those emails back and forth with Strzok and Page about how, how can we use the FBI to destroy him to keep him from getting elected. I mean, this kind of, they need to go to jail. I mean, that is bad stuff, <laughs> John. Pat, the Justice Department has charged two Islamic State terrorists in the murder of American hostages in Syria. El Shafi, El Sheikh, and Alexander Kote are charged with several counts of conspiracy which could carry life imprisonment. The pair says, uh, the indictment rather, says the pair was directly involved in the torturous killings of American journalist James Foley and American aid worker Kayla Mueller and others. The Justice Department says the charges send a strong warning to terrorists. My message to other terrorists is this. If you harm an American, you will face the same fate as these men. You will face American arms in the battlefield. And if you survive that, you will face American justice in an American courtroom and the prospect of many years in an American prison. 
and the families of the victims say they are thankful and hope this will lead to the truth of what happened to their loved ones. Well, for the sixth time this hurricane season, Louisiana is bracing for a potential strike. Hurricane Delta is expected to make landfall sometime Friday with winds potentially topping 100 miles an hour. Officials issuing evacuation orders for several coastal parishes. CBN's Operation Blessing is still on the ground in Lake Charles, Louisiana, helping to clean up after August's uh, Hurricane Laura. And Pat, the ministry also is sending an assessment team to Birmingham, Alabama, in advance of Hurricane Delta. Uh, thank you. And folks, we are staged right now uh, in Alabama to move in as quickly as we can right after that hurricane hits. Of course, we're in the, in the middle of the hurricane, but we will be there afterwards. People need water. They need food. They, they need uh, uh, well, they, they need bedding, they, they need all kinds of things. And we will have uh, a whole team uh, with uh, appropriate equipment ready to go. Uh, it's being staged right now in Alabama, and we'll move in Friday uh, to uh, help those people in Alabama, Louisiana, who are suffering through the, uh, because of the results of this hurricane. Uh, it was building up to a Category 4 in the Gulf. I don't know where it is now. It's probably a 2, but it, it builds up to intensity. It'll be a very, very powerful storm, and uh, it's just unprecedented. We see this kind of thing, and this is one more uh, tragedy that's taking place in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, so it, the, the number for Operation Blessing uh, is 1-800-707-1000, or you can say Disaster Relief Fund, but... Uh, uh, you know, your neighbors, your loved ones, your relatives will be in that area, and we want to be there to help them. Terry? Well, still ahead, a sunny day by the pool turns tragic. What happens after a dad hears a scream that a parent never wants to hear? You'll find out. But first, cancel culture claims another victim. A popular animator has been blacklisted and slammed as a bigot. What did she do, and how is she fighting back? Uh, the left does not want equality. They want dominance. They want to destroy those who disagree with them. And it's now known as the cancel culture. And it strikes again, but this time right here at Regent University, because a talented Regent student ran her own successful animation business until she said no to the wrong people. And then what happened when the cancel culture went to work? And how was her business ruined and her reputation smeared? Heather Sells brings this disturbing story. I've been drawing since I was a little kid. Ever since she's been able to hold a crayon, art has been Emily Arendt's passion. About 11, I saw that people were drawing online and animating online, and um, I instantly just was like, I want to do that too. I didn't. That was 11 years ago. Since then, Arendt has made a name for herself as Lupus Volpes, a top animator known for her eye-popping animal characters and more than 200,000 YouTube followers. Her business proved so successful that she's been able to pay for college with her earnings. So far, it's provided for tuition, room and board at Regent University for the first year and a half. I know that it's just the Lord um, and he's just blessed it so much. Arendt also knew her public testimony as a Christian could be risky. I kind of stood out in this um, community with, like a sore thumb just um, because I love Christ and I didn't draw the same things that other people would draw. The hammer came down this summer when she refused two requests. This person commissioned me to draw a character with the trans flag um, and I told them I don't feel comfortable doing that and um, that I'm a Christian. Then another customer insisted she support the organization Black Lives Matter. They wanted me to earn a bunch of money for um, the organization as well as um, advertise for it because of how big my, um, my following is. They wanted me to make a big imprint with that, but it just felt weird and manipulative, so I just 
wasn't going to do that. That's when Aaron's world suddenly came crashing down. My phone started to blow up with messages and alerts from people. The animation community turned on her, beginning what's known as an official call out, namely for what it labeled as her transphobic and homophobic views. It led to a six page online document complete with links to screenshots and social media detailing her so-called crimes. Countless videos picked apart what she had done, as well as her video response to critics. I love each and every one of you, even those who hate me and viciously attack me now. I am disgusted by this girl and how she actually thinks she can get away with this. She needs to just cast that part of her religion aside for, you know, the greater good and support people for who they are and how they identify instead of, you know, being a bigot. Pastor Lance Bacon, who teaches at Regent, became a mentor to Arendt and admires how she's responded and the questions she's asked. I was so very blessed by the fact that she didn't ask, how might I find legal representation? What can I do about the income, uh, protecting my rights? But instead she said, how do I make sure I respond as a Christian and that I use this opportunity to let God develop me and to show Christian love. Despite demands, Arendt will not apologize. So the animation community that used to commission her work has now blacklisted it. As far as my business, I believe it's destroyed. But Arendt is not giving up on her education. The Lord has, um, he told me to go to Regent. So I'm gonna continue to go to the Regent until the Lord closes that door. And she believes that the Lord will use the hate campaign for his purpose. It looks like from the outside that I've lost, but I, I really think that this has been a victory for the Lord. And if I've, um, if this could have helped one person to find um, Christ, then it's worth it to me to lose my whole business. And I, I really mean that. Heather Sells, CBN News. What a wonderful young lady. We're so proud to have her as a student at Regent University. And if you'd like to show some support for this talented young animator, here's the deal. Go to CBNNews.com and get a link to her newest venture. It's called Chapter 2 Creations. Chapter 2 Creations. So you're not asking anybody to give her money or anything, but just to be there and support her. And if she's got something, Chapter 2 Creations. Yeah. But isn't that terrible? Well, you know, it's so, um, there, there's, we hear from the other side all about tolerance. Yeah. But that doesn't, that door doesn't swing both ways. Total intolerance, total intolerance. I mean, absolutely. If that is the mantra of the left, total intolerance, who wants it? But that's what we're faced with. But we're not going to give in and she's not going to give in, but God bless her. We're so proud to have her as a student at Regent University. Now we're going to talk big time with the expert about climate change. We are. That's still ahead. Is it settled science or just a bunch of hot air? Astrophysicist Dr. Hugh Ross weighs in. But first, a toddler slips out of her life jacket and sinks underwater for several minutes. She survives, but brain damage leaves her blind and unable to speak or walk. How does a wildfire prayer ignite a miracle? Well, stay tuned to find out. that a parent never wants to hear. That was the sound that sent a shocking chill through Chris Love. His 14-month-old daughter was floating lifeless in the family pool. And for nine minutes, his wife Danielle fought to bring breath back into her baby's body. So what happened next? Take a look. Danielle and Chris love sharing a meal on the patio with their four daughters, a weekly tradition at their home in Florida. So on August 7th, 2018, the couple prepared dinner as usual while 14-month-old Isabella played outside near her sisters who had been swimming. But the peace of a seemingly perfect day was interrupted. We heard the girls scream outside, the scream that a parent never wants to hear. Somehow the toddler slipped out of her life jacket and went into the pool unnoticed. 
She had been underwater for several minutes without air when her sisters found her floating with no sign of life. Danielle, a trained water safety instructor, administered CPR. It was just like everything froze for a minute. I would breathe and then I would scream, God, I need you. I was doing CPR for over nine minutes with nothing. And finally, it was like God just put breath in her lungs. She didn't wake up or anything like that, but her body just took breath. And by that time, the first responders were there. Her mom was doing CPR, but in most cases, it's less than like 25% that there's a survival rate. Of course, we had to start an IV and I intubated her and then we flew her out. Isabella was life flighted to a Tampa hospital where it was determined she had gone through the five stages of drowning. Her heart was barely beating when she was placed on life support. Refusing to give up on their daughter, Danielle and Chris called on people from all over the world to pray and believe for a miracle. Pray something happened to Isabella. Just from that one little text, it basically started to walk a wildfire prayer. And within 15 or 20 minutes, we had people praying so our first prayer was, God, we will serve you regardless of what you do. Our second prayer was just that the Lord would give us strength to get through each day. And um, our third prayer was for complete wholeness. So they prayed and waited by her bedside. Miraculously, Isabella made it through the night. Then her heart stabilized, and on the third day, she awakened from her coma three months sooner than the typical timeline but doctors said she would never be the same. She was diagnosed with severe brain damage that caused cortical blindness and the loss of motor skills. Will she ever be the same baby again? She lost her speech, she lost all her motor skills, she couldn't walk, she couldn't, couldn't see, um, so that was a big fear. We had had so much bad news from doctors. They had three neurologists on the case and the first neurologist that came in said brain damage to both sides of the brain, full brain damage. I told him that, you know, I wasn't gonna have, if he could just say brain change for now, that would be great because I wasn't gonna have him speaking, you know, brain damage over her. I mean, we knew that we served a God that was able. And so we would just pray, we would pray, God, you did not bring back our daughter from the dead to halfway heal her. Like we would not accept any halfway healing. The couple prayed with anticipation. Then on the seventh day, a smartphone recording captured a breakthrough. There were small glimpses of where we thought she could see us. And the doctor said, no, that's not possible. We kept trying to argue with the doctors and just say, no, she's seeing us. Like, and this was kind of our, you know, just to build our faith. So we were holding up the camera and recording her and she was just kind of oblivious. She wasn't really looking at us and we were like, come on, Isabella, hey. And then just all of a sudden she looks at us and just locks eyes and she goes, cheese. Cheese. And we're like, what? And we just started crying. And <laughs> That was probably the first thing that she had done before the accident that she had, was able to do again. It was tears of happiness because we knew I mean, that was a big step. She, God had healed the blind in that moment. From that day on, Isabella astonished the medical staff with her rapid rehabilitation, accomplishing six months worth of rehab in 31 days. On September 6, 2018, she returned home and just a couple months later, she had made a full recovery. We always say that, you know, God brought her back and she's even better. She's completely healed. I mean, 100% actually went to the neurologist and they said, you know, for her follow-up appointment that we didn't need them because he was blown away. Just seeing the progressions that she's made, where she's at now, just a complete miracle. That without God, my baby would not be here today. She is just full of personality, full of energy. I mean, she's nonstop. She's a handful, but I'm thankful. Today, they continue a family tradition of gathering around the table with their girls, a precious answer to prayer. Our family would not be the same without Isabella. Like God knew that we needed to keep her, to, to God be the glory to, from beginning to end. A walking miracle. Talk about going from a diagnosis that was dire and left almost no hope to seeing God move 
in a mighty and a powerful way. This mom and dad just refused to accept anything less than what they knew about God and his ability to heal. And so today, believing that ourselves, we want to pray for you. There are many of you out there I know who have been praying, struggling with things in your own lives. The same thing that God did for Isabella, he is able to do for you. And we have some amazing Let's go prayer for reports. It. Yeah, what you got? Karen, who lives in Kent, Washington, she awoke one day with a terrible earache. After three days, she was still in pain and distress. On the third day, she was watching this program, and Pat, she heard you declare healing for someone with, quote, a severe ear infection. You said, you are dealing with a good deal of pain. Karen said she knew it was for her, and she exercised faith in the great physician. The pain left. It has not returned. Praise God. And here's, here's one that's amazing. Laura, who lives in Baltimore, Maryland, struggled with depression. Her unwed daughter was pregnant. Her father had died. Her mother had Alzheimer's, and she had lost several beloved press. You just wonder how many, yeah, uh, how many items of grief can you stand? Well, watching this show, Laura whispered, say my name. And Terry began to pray and said, Laura, just a dark discouragement. You have really been dealing with depression right now. Lift your hands before the Lord is released right now. It's gone. You are free. And immediately, Laura felt God's joy and the cloud of dis, uh, depression disappeared. Listen, God can raise the dead. He calls from up from nothing that which is. The world that we see is from nothing, and it's spoken by the Word of God. His Word is powerful. He said, let there be light, and there was light. Let the stars and the moon show forth, and they were, they were so. He said, let the earth bring forth uh, plants and, and animals teeming with life, and it was so. God spoke life, and he's going to speak life to you right now. This is, with God, nothing is impossible. Now, Terry and I are going to join hands, and we're going to believe God, and I want you to pray with us. Nothing is impossible with God. Father, Thank you for the miracles we've already heard. Thank you for the miracle, that little girl that had this tremendous miracle. Thank you for Laura and what you've done in her life. And Lord, thank you for right now, the Charlene, and you've been praying. Uh, you have a, it looks like a kidney stone, and you are really suffering. That, that thing just hurts like crazy. Right now, that stone is going to pass. In the name of Jesus, you are totally healed. Touch. Yeah. Terry. Yeah, there's someone, um, you've, you've been praying for a long time about something with the Lord. I don't really know what this is. I don't know if it's physical, financial, psychological, whatever, but... How you'll know this is you is your name is Alexander. People do not call you Al or Alex. They call you Alexander. God is in the midst of changing your situation. Lift your hands up, Alexander, and begin to thank and praise the Lord before you even see what's being done. Uh, I believe the name is Mary. You have a lump uh, in, in in your right breast and and. Uh, it, it is malignant, but God right now is taking it away. You are being completely healed in the name of Jesus. It will not metastasize. The Lord is wiping out that cancer. You'll feel heat right there in the name of Jesus. Terry, what else you yeah, The Lord is also wiping out despair from people, not just a little depression, but despair. Listen, lift your hands right now and begin to thank the Lord and claim this and declare it as your own. He is setting you free today. Receive it in Jesus' name. And once more, we pray for this nation. In the name of Jesus, may the power of God come down. May there be peace in our land. May strife be lifted. May the Lord send his peace. Shalom, great peace have they that love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. And may the peace of God descend upon our nation. In Jesus' name, give us miracles for the nation of the United States of America. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. Terry. Oh, yeah. by the way, call us. Let us know what's happened. We love to hear the answers to prayer, and we love to pray for you. So it's 1-800-700-7000, toll-free number. Please call, okay? Well, you mentioned what's next, the truth about climate change and how we can fix it. 
Plus, can we stop global warming and save our economy along the way? Dr. Hugh Ross has the answers coming up. And then later, make sure your DVRs are on record because your questions and honest answers are coming up. Carol asks, why does your show promote the old earth theory and not the other biblical viewpoint, which is believed by most Christians? What will Pat say to that? You'll find out later on today's program. Welcome back to Washington for the CBN News Break. An international outcry over an Iranian pastor who's being held in one of the world's worst prisons. Youssef Nardakani is serving a six year sentence in the notorious Evan prison in Tehran for, quote, propagating house churches, which have been accused of promoting Zionist Christianity. Iranian authorities have charged the 43 year old of allegedly endangering the country's national security with his Christian activities. Members of the U.S. government have called for Nardakani's release, labeling him a religious prisoner. Well, here in the United States, organizers of a Christian tour say hearts were filled with the Holy Spirit last weekend in Texas as thousands of people joined worship leader Sean Foyt and his team at the latest stops on their nationwide Let Us Worship tour. Dr. Charles Kruku with International Outcry Church said the number of people baptized during the event, quote, kept going on and on. Worship was unstoppable, he said. The weekend included more than 5,000 attendees climbing to the top of a mountain to worship and pray at the 77-foot empty cross in Kerrville, where men, women, and children rejoice together in the name of Jesus. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at cbnnews.com. Pat and Terry will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Hurricanes, wildfires, dying coral reefs, climate change has been blamed for all sorts of global problems. The UN wants to solve it with heavy taxes. And the Green New Deal has about a $3 trillion price of what they want to do. But is there another way? Take a look. Dr. Hugh Ross, author and astronomer, has spent years researching the history of the Earth. When it comes to climate change, he believes you don't have to pick a side on the issue. In his book, Weathering Climate Change, Dr. Ross uses evidence and facts from multiple scientific disciplines to share some unexpected ways to approach the subject that can benefit us all. Well, Dr. Hugh Ross has joined us now, and then Dr. Ross, it's just a joy to have you with us. Uh, your book is fascinating. It's called uh, Weathering Climate Change. And uh, you, you say we've been living in a very benign period of climate stability. Can you tell us about that? Yes, I mean, uh, the norm for planet Earth is climate instability. In order to feed billions of human beings, you have to be living during an ice age cycle. Uh, the melting ice provides us with water for agricultural plains. The retreating of the ice fertilizes our great agricultural plains. But we are in an ice age cycle. The global mean temperature jumps up and down by more than 10 degrees centigrade on time scales of just a few centuries. The miracle is, for the past 9,500 years, the global mean temperature has not changed by more than plus or minus 0 0.65 degrees. This is unprecedented in the history of our planet. And in my book, I talk about all the fine tuning that's necessary to bring about this extraordinary period of climate stability. So we need to see this as a gift from God. Uh, this is a special thing that God has given us and is intent on us actually using that to fulfill our purpose here on Earth. But the ice ages, though, but, but every 41,000 years or so, that we, we go into a cycle of, of, of extreme cold? Yes, I mean, what people don't realize is that global warming always brings on global cooling. Mm. If we were to warm the planet by another two degrees centigrade, you melt the summer polar ice cap. And when you do that, you cause a lot more water vapor to go up out of the Arctic Ocean. And that falls as snow on Canada and Siberia. And that brings on the next ice age. But I really wrote the book to make the point. There's a way we can continue to stabilize the climate of planet Earth while we boost the world economy rather than cripple the world economy. 
And instead of passing these draconian laws uh, that cripple our economy, we can actually give people an economic incentive to stabilize the climate, not just for our benefit, but for the benefit of all life. And that's a biblical mandate. We're to manage the planet's resources for our benefit and the benefit of the rest of Earth's life. Oh, it's interesting. You talked about the uh, the flooding of the rice paddies and it, it, it generates methane gas. Uh, is there some way we can uh, do the rice differently the way that we're growing? Will that make a big difference? That would make a huge difference. Uh, there's a way we can redo uh, our uh, rice cultivation where we actually get more rice, healthier rice, and you pull more greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere than we're pulling out right now. It's a win-win-win uh, solution. And that's kind of a biblical principle that God designed the planet so that we're caught between what appears to be a rock and a hard place, we will find win-win solutions. And I basically load the book up with ways uh, that we can keep the climate stable, benefit all the wildlife out there, make our planet more beautiful, and put more money in everybody's pockets, and especially in the pockets of the poorest people of the world. Who in his right mind would vote against that? Well, what else would you need me to do besides to fix the rice? Uh, you, you had something about stagnant water and the waterways. Uh, can we manage them to? Is it methane or, or, or CO? Uh, you know, uh, CO2. Uh, what are we dealing well, with? Hey, for example, to uh, uh, build dams. I mean, people are saying we need to get rid of all the dams because it causes stagnation in the water and releases greenhouse gases, that can happen. But there are ways we can build dams where we actually uh, have less stagnant water, actually create cleaner water for the wildlife, and you produce more electricity. Again, it's a win-win solution. Well, what about the NOx? I mean, uh, nitric oxide, uh, where does that come from? And that, that's more difficult to get rid of than the methane. Well, that's an important uh, point you're bringing up, Pat, is that there's all this focus on carbon dioxide. That's one of four major greenhouse gases we need to be paying attention to. And if we put all of our focus on carbon dioxide, we can wind up putting more methane and nitrous oxides in the atmosphere. And people are overlooking black carbon soot. I mean, uh, you know, one reason why Canada is warming as rapidly as it is is not so much carbon dioxide, it's all that black carbon soot being wafted up from India and China and being deposited there on the snow. And that's one of the points I make in the book. Global warming is a complex issue. We need to look at it from a multi-scientific disciplinary perspective and look for ways uh, that we can solve these problems in a way that motivates people economically. I mean, I'm opposed to actually having the government pass these laws it's so much easier. I mean, people, if you pass the laws, that basically gets people panicking. <laughs> and that, that means you're going to have unintended consequences. If we can give people a simple, straightforward uh, economic motivation, we won't have to pass these laws. Well, what motivation would you give them? Well, for example, one thing I suggest is we could give the sub-Saharan peoples all the kerosene they want to burn as they see fit on the condition they help us replant the Sahara Desert. We could literally shrink the Sahara Desert down to one-tenth of its current size. It can now become a location where we're growing grains that would soak up huge quantities of greenhouse gases and provide significant income for those North, North African people. And it would restore the habitat for the wildlife there. And that could be done in the Gobi Desert. It could be done in any desert that we human beings have expanded. Well, you pointed out the Romans used to get their grain out of the Sahara. I remember the Sahel was growing, and, and we got together, and I think we planted, uh, I believe it was 3 million trees. It was like 10 miles of trees in the Sahel. But uh, it, it's very inexpensive to plant those trees. Well, it's something we could do with our own forests. I mean, a lot of our national parks and forests, we don't allow the lumbering companies to come in. Consequently, the old large trees uh, die, and when they die, they decay and release greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. We'd be better off letting the lumbering companies come in and selectively harvest those old trees that are in danger of dying, and that's where you make your most money because they're really big trees. You plant them replant them with young trees. 
They grow two to four times faster than the old trees, which means you're pulling two to four times as much greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere. The forest is going to look a lot prettier for the tourists. <laughs> the wildlife is going to like it because they can actually move around in the forest rather than being blocked by the dead wood. Now, you talked about the ellipsis of the Earth. I mean, the, 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 the planet itself shifts in relation to the sun, though. The, the, there's, there's more than just what we do on Earth, isn't there? Well, yeah, the natural cycles are actually cooling the planet. I mean, uh, our, our rotation axis tilts back and forth between 22 and 24 degrees. And right now, it's tilting down towards 22, which means it's causing the planet to get colder. The miracle of the past 9,500 years, we've had several natural cycles cooling the planet. And normally, it would cool it by about 10 degrees centigrade, which would drop us into an ice age. But the climate temporarily stabilized. And with that stabilization, humans launched civilization. And that launch caused a warming effect. And for 9,500 years, the warming by human activity has perfectly counterbalanced the cooling from the natural cycles. So you've got fine tuning on the natural stuff as well as on the human activity. It's only the past 70 years that's gotten out of balance. But again, I argue there's a way we can correct that. Well, it's, it's so encouraging. Well, you've talked about the Tibetan ice sheet. You've talked about Antarctica. Uh, you talked about Greenland. Now, there's certain big ice uh, areas that, that would balance the uh, global warming. Is that right? Well, uh, the miracle is that we have the sun warmer than it's ever been in the history of the Earth. And uh, for 90% of Earth's history, we've had no ice at all. And yet we got ice today when the sun is brighter than it's ever been in life's history. Uh, but one reason why is the Tibetan plateau has been getting higher and higher. The Indian subcontinent crashed into Asia that lifted up the Tibetan plateau to such a high elevation that snow and ice began to form. And today that's the third largest store of ice on planet Earth. And because it's close to the equator, it reflects sunlight four times more efficiently than ice over Antarctica and ice over Greenland. And so that explains why we've got this store of ice we can use to support our agriculture and why we can have a stable climate when the sun is as bright as it is. And incidentally, you only get the solar luminosity stability that makes civilization possible when the sun is at its current luminosity. Well, you, you, you basically are saying God has, has set the world in a particular uh, orbit and the climate is ideal for the growth of human beings. And, and uh, it's only a proliferation of humans in the last what few decades, huh? Well, I've been writing in my books that literally everything we see and measure about the universe, uh, Earth, and uh, what's going on on planet Earth and Earth's light, all of it is fine-tuned to make possible the existence of billions of human beings where we have the technology and the civilization that these billions can hear the gospel message and respond to what God is offering. The whole universe was designed to make that possible. This period of climate stability we're in right now is designed to make that possible. God wants billions to receive redemption from Him and enter into an eternal loving relationship with it. Man, that's a marvelous message. Uh, God bless you. This book is called um, Weathering Change, A Fresh Approach. You want to get a copy of it wherever books are sold. Dr. Hugh Ross, isn't that interesting? Fascinating. It's fascinating. Oh, it's fascinating. I love what he has to say. All right, well, let, let's, well we've we got a few uh, questions. So on the heels of that, this right. is Carol who says, why does your show promote the old earth theory and not the other biblical viewpoint, which is believed by most Christians? Well, I don't think most Christians have got, uh, you know, uh, stupid enough to believe that other. The other is the Usher theory. You, the, you added all the generations from Adam until, until the current time. And you say, all right, that adds up to 7,000. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so, therefore, the Earth is only 7,000 years old. Well, that's just nonsense. I mean, there are just too many geological factors, too many uh, things that have happened on Earth. Uh, it, it, the Earth is, is about 14 billion years old. 
and you, there's just no question about it. You've got the dinosaurs, you've got all the things that have happened on this earth, and the, there's too much geology. I mean, it's just established science. So the idea of uh, you know, having a, a six or seven thousand year uh, earth is just, it's just, any Christians who believe that, just, I, I, I'm telling you that they aren't very up on today's, I believe science. I mean, let's face it, you know, God didn't, I mean, look at who he was. He said, you know, he's written things. He said, this whole planet was set up uh, for God's purpose. And the universe is tuned for life. But it didn't get here in six or seven thousand years. It got here over almost 14 billion years to get this earth to where it is right now. Okay. Well, that's all the time we have for oh. today, but thank you, thank you. Enjoy Dr. Ross being with us for it's certain. Tremendous. Well, we leave you with these words from the book of Romans. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Tomorrow, a stunning confession about prayer from the daughter of Billy Graham. And Graham Lotz is going to join us tomorrow on, on tomorrow's 700 Club. So for Terry and all of us, this is Pat Robertson. Thank you for being with us. God bless you as we continue to serve the Lord. We want you to be uh, blessed and uh, stay well, as they say, and stay happy. Bye-bye.